Welcome to the Sensual Sessions, the place to explore your sensations as a source of pleasure through your senses. I am Candia Raquel, founder of Centro de Poder, and today we have a very special guest. This is Robert Boyd, founder of Triangle Feldenkrais, and he's also a scientist, a mathematician, expert in computer science, and his views on movement and the Feldenkrais method and sensitivity are unique. I am happy to welcome Robert. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Sessions. Thank you, Candia. So tell us about the way that you made a wonderful shift, inner shift, from relying on everyone else as external and ultimate authorities of how would how should you stand, how should you move, how should you maybe even think to to then becoming your own source of authorizing yourself and i believe this this is important for for everyone to know because when it comes to pleasure and to expressing sensually that pleasure that we live in our flesh we often try to find a reference to know whether whereas it's good or bad should you be mm -hmm. feeling or expressing that way or the other way when i believe yeah. that pleasure is singular it has to do with with your own way of experiencing yourself and expressing yourself yeah so would you share with us your wonderful journey okay I i'd love to uh, i have uh, i've experienced I experienced several different things that uh, influenced me in this discovery process. Uh, when I first uh, when I first started experiencing the Feldenkrais work, I was also uh, working with a psychotherapist, and so there was this interesting convergence of uh, learning about emotions and words for emotions and physical sensation uh, and thought and how they're connected uh, from just a, a a psychotherapy view of things and then at the same time i was working through some physical issues uh, injuries that I had that I wanted to help resolve and I was working with a Feldenkrais teacher for that and uh, what I've come to understand in recent years as I as I reflect on what was actually going on uh, and like I mentioned earlier uh, in some of our conversation there was a point in my journey where I began to realize that I was shifting away from my view of uh, people with expertise as authorities who I should let tell me how to be to people to consult for ideas about choices I might make. And uh, so in my reflections in recent years, what I've realized is that the psychotherapy work and the Feldenkrais work both were inviting me into a space to pay attention to sensations and emotion and thoughts. And uh, how those result in relationship to activity and movement. And uh, 
you know, in terms of self-image, uh, there's something that happens without necessarily having to be able to understand it. When we do things, when I do things where I'm involved in an activity and at the same time I'm paying attention to the sensations that I have in my body uh, that are occurring because of that activity, then I can have impressions of whether that the sensations are pleasurable or not pleasurable or comfortable, uncomfortable, uh, exciting, disappointing. Uh, and the more that I allow myself to experience the sensations of something, the more my nervous system forms a map of uh, who I am and how, how I relate to my world. The more you uh, allow- If I simply go through- Yeah, so just to recap what yeah, you said- go ahead. The more you are aware to your sensations, the clearer the image of who you are. Was that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so what, what my therapist was doing was inviting me to explore words for emotions, a large, uh, a large uh, library of words that we use for emotional states. And many of them, when I first started reviewing them, I was like, I don't know what that feels like in me. I, I don't even know if I know if I feel that. And so he began working with me to uh, get me to query uh, when questions like, when you think about uh, being in the presence of that person, do you get a sensation in your body? And what is, where is that in your body? And what is the sensation that you feel? And if you were going to pick a word to describe that, which of these emotion words would you use, maybe? And uh, so over many months, I began to uh, expand my repertoire of what the sensations in my body might actually mean in terms of an emotion. And uh, learning that emotions are uh, the way we think about things often determines how we respond physically to certain situations. Um, what we've told ourselves about the world and our relationship to it in regard to certain things uh, gives us uh, predispositions to emotional responses. Yes. Like, uh, some people are scared when they're in a dark place and some people, when the lights go out, they're like, okay, the lights are out. And uh, there's no fear associated with it. So there's something about the way different people think that determines the emotion that we have in situations. So, uh, what I want to say about the Feldenkrais work is that over time, I began to understand more and more that many of the lessons that, well, I'd say really just about all of the lessons that Feldenkrais himself developed and that other teachers since him have developed and the way we work with people uh, hands-on, uh, what we're doing is, as a student, what we're 
doing is we're being invited to attend to the sensations we have when our body is moved a certain way. When we activate muscles to make our body do something, uh, instead of being detached from what's happening, we're invited into a space to pay attention to, well, when I move my arm this way, what does my foot do? And uh, how do, what does it make my skin do on the surface that I'm supported on? Whether I'm standing, sitting, lying down, uh, you know, how much of all my parts can I feel sensorially when I make this movement? Can I make the movement small enough so that I can feel all these different things? Can I map, uh, when I tilt my head, can I map through my body what my spine does, what my pelvis does, what my uh, legs do, what my feet do? Uh, can I sense what my ribs do? And the more I make space in those moments to register the sensations and the connections, the more full my mental map is of who I am. Uh, I cease. I convert from having some sort of ideological awareness of myself to a, a fundamental physical foundation of what I am and the possibilities I have, the, the things that I try to do that don't work, uh, the things that I try to do and I discover, oh, that feels really nice. Or I try this and, well, that's okay, but it doesn't feel good. Or um, I can do this movement smoothly, this movement when I do it, not so smooth. Uh, this muscle's strong, this muscle's weak. Um, and uh, it just expands uh my awareness of where i am in relation to the world around me and also uh how what i do is affecting me yeah it, it expands the way that you know the way you are in the world and how yeah. what is happening going on affects you and it's very interesting that you mention emotions uh, feelings and also sensations and both aspects mm -hmm. like emo emotions slash feelings like your your feelings of love mm -hmm. your feelings of anger and your feeling of awe mm -hmm. those are emotional feelings versus the sensations of is it comfortable my my support in this feet when I, what i am feeling in in the right shoulder when i move that feet so yeah. you mentioned both say cognitive domains mm -hmm. anchored in the body in the sen in in the yeah. physical sensation so this is fascinating because uh say anger or rage that i get mm -hmm. all red when i get angry it's not often but <laughs> it's very obvious yeah. for me and the world that i am angry because i turn on my tomato mode like yeah red face like the emoji <laughs> mm -hmm. so it's like yeah <laughs> this this that i feel in the body is the feeling of anger of the emotion of anger or say the feeling mm -hmm. of love. And there's also an, the discursive rational component of the language to describe yeah. and label 
that experience mm -hmm. that was a practice from uh, instructed by your psychologist or therapist that you yeah. have this repertoire of words of emotions so like that time that you feel felt that thing when that other thing happened like how were you feeling how how would you level that emotion and it's very interesting like how through through the awareness and the language you or anyone can become an emotional literate like to to know yes how, how to to point with precision what's going on in you to start with like then you maybe can continue yeah. with empathy and compassion to the other <laughs> but if you cannot acknowledge that yeah. yourself with that clarity using the language it's going to be very hard like to to yeah to pinpoint through awareness what is going on so it's great that so far we are speaking about like three cognitive domains or layers of of the self or the self image as spoken in feldenkrais that are the emotions feelings the yeah. sensations and the thoughts like the rational the yeah. rational mind and how mm -hmm. like this this practice of and there's another component there's an and there's there's, there's another uh, component let, and let's, there let, let's go into that component after i finish wrapping up these three components <laughs> like for the okay. others to follow through yeah so so we have like the emotions the sensations and the thoughts the the language anchored but it's it's in this like self understanding or self or yeah self awareness that happens a clearer image of who you are and how you are for yourself and for the world so you're not so through through this like self awareness you're not only being an effect of the world but you like like sourcing uh, the reality on yourself from external external people or authorities to tell you like what you're feeling is right or wrong you're moving the right or the wrong way and it yeah it's it's a way mm -hmm. to take ownership and agency and also and be an authority on yourself so yes tell us what is another component to it okay so the the other component that i've become aware of through the feldenkrais work is that uh and there's people in other fields who've studied this also uh, our nervous system forms a map of our physicality and uh, uh, a word that's used for that is the homunculus. Our, our brain actually has a map of our body and to the degree that we allow ourselves to process information about our sensations, that map is more or less complete uh, and one of the things that happens when we do investigative movement where we pay attention to sensation and emotion and thought while doing movement yes we provide our system with the necessary information to expand that map of our self and that map is a part of us that operates without words. It's something that truly for most people is very subconscious. It's not, uh, but, when, but when someone says 
something like, oh, I couldn't possibly do that, or I would never do that. That's information that their image of themselves excludes a certain kind of behavior. Uh, it might be that because of a pain they have in their ankle, they would say, well, I couldn't possibly jump like that because it will hurt too much in my ankle. But they wouldn't say all that. Someone might say, well, why don't you just do some jump rope? It'll make you feel good. And they're very, I mean, immediately they know, oh, I couldn't do that. They don't even have to think about it because they're that physical, that nervous system representation of themselves already has decided no that that movement is not in our available repertoire and so you. instead of saying that would be very uncomfortable for me they just say i couldn't do that i want i i would never do that um so uh to me the work that like the Feldenkrais work or any other that invites people into a space, uh, a lot of the tantric practices are very similar in the way they work because they, they are about paying attention to sensation and thought and emotion in a very open way without judgment, just to experience what happens. And, um, so uh, the Feldenkrais work and the tantric models are just two different ways among probably many that uh, help us inform ourselves about what we are, what we can be, uh, what we would like, what we wouldn't like. Yes, inform, inform us ourselves. Gives us more freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, inform ourselves on who, how we are, how we would like to be, and that yep. gives us choice. And that <clears throat> is key for, for satisfaction in many ways, because often, like, yeah. we, we tend to either compare ourselves with, ourselves with a Hollywood star or idealize <laughs> yeah. a, a role model, like, no, I am team Johnny Depp, mm -hmm. or no, I am team Amber and who is right, etc. And we are only placing yeah. on someone else the, the image of how our desire realizations would look like, while at the same time <clears throat> believing that that is pertaining only to that idealized image of someone else because you don't even know Johnny mm -hmm. Deep or Madonna or etc. or Anita, whoever is trending. <laughs> yeah. And that also yeah. relieves you from, from, from the maturity and responsibility of taking action in yourself on the expression of, of that true aspect of you. So it what what you're talking about on this like practice of self-awareness through movement and becoming cognizant of your self-image like really paying attention on what's going mm -hmm. on you without judgment and through curiosity to really know who you are not only discursively i mean yes through the worlds but also at a flesh level, at a sensory level, and the yeah. way that you and only you express your beingness freely into the world. So mm -hmm. this is fantastic, Rob. Would you share with us a little three, five minute exercise to get a taste of this? How is this self-image <laughs> sensed? Hmm. Well, uh, 
something simple uh, might be just to experience the hands in a different way. Uh, so to begin with, uh, simply, uh, you can do this eyes open or eyes closed, but to uh, notice, uh, perhaps to just relax the hands for a moment and uh, just be aware of how they're placed. Maybe they're resting on the lap or maybe on a piece of furniture, uh, but to just notice what sensations are coming from the hands, uh, what, what kind of temperature sensations, what kind of pressure, uh, what part of the hands are contacting something and is that contact comfortable, uncomfortable, heavy, light, warm, cold, uh, are there other sensations or, or is something itchy in the hands or uh, maybe there's a place that feels dry or are the hands feeling comfortable, uh, you know, uh, supple? Are there any joints in the fingers that have something to say? Uh, sometimes a joint might be a little sore or Maybe they're all comfortable at the moment. Um, you know, maybe there's been some recent injury, a, a paper cut or knife cut while prepping food. If you have something like that, how does that feel uh, with your hands relaxed? Uh, then, uh, well, after tuning into that, then take the hands and place them behind the neck and interlace the fingers. So then, um, again, tune into the sensations that generates. Uh, you know, obviously, you'll have some sensations on the skin of the neck and the back of the head, but then ask your fingers. What do they sense? How does it feel to have them interlaced? Are they comfortable like that? Are some of the fingers maybe under a bit of pressure uh, to be in that arrangement? How does the weight feel behind the head compared to down below in a relaxed position? Um, does the temperature change in any part of the hands to do this? And then uh, slowly let the fingers come apart and just notice the sensations of the fingers rubbing against each other as they come apart. And uh, whatever awareness comes from that contact, is it a, uh, are the fingers well hydrated? Do you feel some resistance or are they dry and they slide quite easily? Uh, and let the hands come completely apart and return to resting on the lap or somewhere in front. <clears throat> and then just see what sensations you have in this new relaxed position after getting that information behind the head and see if anything's changed. Is there something that you noticed before that changed or is there something new that you notice now that you didn't notice before? I noticed that it changed. And then mind. after. Yeah, so, okay, that's great. So now do the same thing of interlacing the fingers behind the head, but shift the fingers so that they're interlaced the opposite of what they were before. And this, for some people, this will feel very strange. Others maybe 
not so strange. Um, and again, just invite your curiosity to explore, does this change the contact with your neck and the back of your head to do this? How does it affect the elbows and the shoulders? Uh, is there something that you have to reorganize in order to have your fingers interlaced this way instead of the other? And then uh, also begin to ask, well, what about the sensations in the fingers themselves? Maybe they're not used to being touching in this order. Uh, because if we seldom interlace them this way, you're going to be generating sensations of parts of you touching each other that usually don't. So the question is, well, does that feel comfortable? Does it feel strange? Uh, is the temperature different? in this arrangement than before, or is it the same? Uh, does the weight feel the same or different? And for some, for some of us, it requires actually a significant shift in the shoulders and elbows to make this small change. Uh, it could introduce stresses in the shoulders that some, our muscles, because of the unfamiliarity, there's some, uh, effort involved to hold that configuration. So then uh, again, slowly let the fingers come apart, but don't bring them up, down yet. Just keep them behind your head and then slide them back together in this new arrangement. And see if doing it the second time maybe feels more familiar than it did at first. Or maybe it feels even more strange. It could go either way. To me, uh, what's remarkable about doing a simple exercise like this is that it's so provocative. Uh, one time I did this with a group of business people and one man in the group was so freaked out by the sensations he was getting that he couldn't even believe it was his own hands. It, he was creeped out. <laughs> it was, it was so. So the guy freaked out. There's one more step to this. Yeah. Uh, he, he, it, it was so unnerving to this one man that he wouldn't do it anymore. Uh, so while everyone else was continuing with the exploration, he just had to stop because it was so strange. He ran away from himself. So, and, yeah, yeah, he was not prepared to tolerate that new sensation. So that's something that can happen for anybody in certain situations. We can experience something and be so uh, unprepared to tolerate whatever uh, thoughts and emotions come from the new sensation that instead of processing it and becoming friends with it, we reject it and run away from it. And uh, this can happen with food. Uh, it can happen with uh, visual sensation. It can happen with uh, different kinds of touch. Uh, it can happen with other activities. Uh, I would, uh, I grew up in a culture that uh, rejected dance as something that was From sexually river. stimulating and was really. Sensually hmm? stimulating? 
That's yeah, the dance was uh, dance was sexual in nature, and also uh, you shouldn't dance with someone who's not your partner uh, because you could get aroused, and that would be bad uh, because you might do things that weren't uh, appropriate, and so. When I was in college, I was part of a choral group that got invited to do a performance at Disneyland as part of a tour that we were doing. And the director of the chorus decided to have us do a dance number with a song. And so I wound up partnered with a woman who wasn't my girlfriend and she was actually married to somebody. Oh. And it was quite pleasurable dancing with her, but I had all these thoughts about this is not okay. It's not okay for me to get aroused moving with this person. Uh, so I had, no, I had no bucket for what I was feeling. So I was able to do it but I was uncomfortable the whole time. So instead of uh, relaxing and enjoying the sensations and just being okay with letting it happen and having a nice interaction with this very pleasant woman who was in the chorus with me, uh, I was just having all this discomfort, which took away from the fun of doing the performance and. Uh, when I look turmoil. over time, yeah, over time, uh, as I explored things later in life, my whole perspective on that changed completely. I wish I could go back and somehow help that younger me uh, be better prepared for the emotions that come with having that kind of sensual experience. Uh, the way that I was brought up, I was taught that I shouldn't be having those sensations and thoughts. And so instead of helping me be prepared to have them and be okay and just act normal, uh, I got all in this internal uh, turmoil. So anyway, take your hands apart <laughs> and bring them to your lap again. Uh, I am gonna have like tremendous biceps here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, okay, and, and so you know, there's one more thing to do. Before we talk about Disneyland and dancing. Okay. Yeah, so there's one more thing to do. That's to um, pay attention to how your hands feel now that you're resting them. See if anything new has developed. And when you're ready, put them behind your head and interlace them again the way you did the first time. I the, don't remember. The, your natural way of interlacing them. <laughs> they were not from first, right? Yeah, there's one that is like more. Yeah, whichever. whichever. Yeah. The one that feels like your natural way. The more familiar. So then the question now is, what do you notice doing this after having them the other way? It's easier. Is there something you notice now that, yeah? And. What about sensations? Do you have sensation information that comes from having done it the other way? Do you sense more of your fingers in some way? I am suspiciously tilting to one side because <laughs> I, I can't repress it, but it feels yeah. so good in the armpit. <laughs> yeah, sincerely. Yeah. Yeah, and on the other way, on the other side, yeah feels great too, like I feel the abdominal so on one side to the other, but all of this is like orchestrated by the hands. 
I can. No. So yeah. now try switching. Okay, so it's without easy. without bringing your hands down. Okay. You know, try just sliding them apart okay. and sliding them together the new way. Well, the other I opened more. <laughs> <laughs> so now switch back. So Again, just switch the... between the. Yeah, just switch to the natural first way again and do hold it for a moment and then switch to the new way again. So just feel that transition from one to the other and see how is the transition? Is it an easy transition or is it somehow effortful? Piece of cake. Is there some way you can make it easier? Yeah, okay. Some people struggle with it. Some people find that switching between them takes a fair amount of concentration and effort. Others do it more easily. I would guess because of your experience with movement that probably these kind of things might be easier for you. Um, yeah, but I do feel a difference. Because you've done a lot of, yeah. Yeah, I feel like like moving from one side to the brain to the other. Almost as if my yeah. my little inner self jumped into the swimming pool of one side of the brain, came out and jumped to the other side. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a, yeah, that's a, a big change of overall sensation of the whole body by something as nuanced yeah. as changing the the finger interlacing, like with one side. Like this, this is the side that I want to open the eye, or it tends to just open. And the other side yeah. just wants to open hmm. or the armpit into a side bend. Yeah. Yeah. And this, all of that is affecting your whole body. If you think, uh, just tune into how it affects how you're sitting, it affects how your weight is distributed in your seat. And uh, it probably is affecting how your feet are uh, supported to some degree. It, it Maybe even how your toes arrange. It affects this the sensation of myself. Like I feel yeah. differently. Yeah. So. To me, this is this kind of exploration is the is a open gateway for discovering things about ourselves that probably are laying hidden uh, possibilities, uh, unexpressed desires, uh, understandings of our relationship to the world around us. Our relationship to ourself. Yes. Uh, sometimes in the movement lessons, I've uh, felt a great degree of frustration uh, because something I was being asked to try to do seemed impossible. And how I responded to that seeming impossibility was a lesson in itself, not just the physical sensation, but the struggle I had inside of trying to achieve. The movement that was being suggested uh, and discovering oh that's not easy for me i wanted to be able to do it i'm i feel blocked i don't like being blocked and you know all this uh, and then later in many cases the lesson went through a progression of uh, movement explorations that actually opened the way to being able to do the thing that was seemingly impossible at the beginning. So there's this having that arc of seeing impossible and then later possible. There's something that happens in my self image of having that experience of going from one to the other and going, oh, Maybe there's other things that I think are impossible now that could become possible with the right exploration, with the right guidance. 
And instead of seeing, uh, it helps me be more open to possibility to know that I can go from obstructed to possible and some and in many cases from possible to easy or even elegant with something that before was not even accessible. And having those experiences changes how I see myself. And it, it wipes out whatever stories I've gotten from people who said, oh, you can't do that, or um, you're not good at that, or you should never try that because you're not such and such. <laughs> the sources of external authority. So my internal yeah. authority is about to cramp on one shoulder. <laughs> yeah, you should you should definitely rest and uh, not do this now for a while. <laughs> Thank you. But so, it's something you can always play with, and you can invite other people to play with. Yeah, it it was very interesting the story of dancing with a partner in Disneyland because sometimes we believe an external authority to to direct our ourselves, mm -hmm. and when we question that external authority, maybe it's Maybe it was that that other person got aroused dancing with anyone, and he then transmitted that, and and also his his judgment about that and the conditions of when was it appropriate and when it yeah. was inappropriate. And the thing is that we yeah. introject the the society's experience without examining mm -hmm. if at least those are a, a match in our perception of of reality and in that questioning begins the yeah. taking back agency on your own self and and also the responsibility of of knowing yourself and deciding for you yes. instead of relying on an external mm -hmm. source because if someone tells you to do something and you do it and it doesn't work, then you have someone to blame, to put the responsibility on. <laughs> yes. And that, that is in a yes. way staying small, immature, and in contrast, all this um, becoming aware of, of our sensations, our emotions, our discursive thinking, our actions, and adding discernment on whether yes. something as simple, if you prefer this or this, what you like the better, how does it feel? How yes. do you feel that you are mm -hmm. more who you truly are? And relying on that sensation as a source of your own truth, because it's not, it's not a truth has nothing to do with obedience truth it's all about inner authority <laughs> right. and obedience it's all about external authority but no one in the world can know how you mm -hmm. feel feel in as a matter of feelings nor know how you sense how what is the sense how does it feels to be you in the same way that i cannot know how does mm -hmm. it feels to be Madonna or Brad Pitt or Anita because only they in their flesh know what, what's that. And that's a key point for going yes. from, from com comparison and idealization to inspiration that is something very different. That one can be inspired mm -hmm. by a teacher, even by, by an authority, but what mm -hmm. what inspires is someone talking through their example leading with the example and then you can be inspired so it's not like i wish i i was that person or i was in that conditions no the the reframe is to to then like okay 
that person is relying on its resources or in its creativity or whatever. So if that person is doing that, maybe I can see what of that resonates as a truth in me. And that's like yeah. taking back your center of power, detailing your, your self-image, the yes. sense of yourself, and then presenting to the, to the world sincerely. Yeah, and the same thing uh, works for emotions. Uh, emotions primarily are a source of information about our experience. It yeah. doesn't, the emotion doesn't tell us what to do. Uh, we get to decide, uh, you know, just because I feel attraction to someone doesn't mean that. I'm going to do some action to pursue it. Or if I feel angry, it doesn't necessarily tell me how to behave. It tells me that there's something I don't like. Yeah. And then the question is, well, what am I going to do about that? Yeah. You know, and what am I going to set a boundary or am I not? Yeah. And, and that's the key. Like acknowledge what is going on and the the cohesive element of this self-image is action, movement. What you gonna do about that? You don't like that? What you gonna do about that? And not not responding to what you yeah. don't like is a way of doing. Is a is the is a action of no action of of no is a response of no reaction in a in a way. And yeah, this is very important discernment like to place to place pleasure in in your own hands and mm -hmm. place also your decision upon your desires on your own hands like how you acknowledge what happens in you and how will you act or not upon that taking yeah. ownership on you and this wonderful gift that is being alive. So Robert, this has been a wonderful yeah. conversation. Please tell us how, how can we know more about you. your work? Do you have a social media profile, website? <laughs> so uh, mainly I have a website. It's trianglefeldenkreis.com. Uh, some of my experiences I've written about there with some articles. And uh, I do have some social media profiles. I have one on Instagram uh, and uh, Facebook. Uh, probably the best information currently is on my website. I might be adding some to the social media in the near future. These conversations with you have certainly provoked me in a nice way to uh, consider sharing more of what I've learned. I've certainly developed additional insights over the years as I've been with this way of learning for longer. Yes. And uh, I've had great pleasure in talking with you. It's uh, brought out things uh, that I didn't even realize uh, I had some coherent thoughts about. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you, sometimes we know stuff and we take it for granted because that's, that's the downside of mastery that something that was impossible <laughs> for you became possible, then easy and then elegant. And then you see it as a piece of cake yeah. and forget that it was impossible for you as it is impossible for many people. And that's something wonderful about the self-image, how we can get actualized, yeah. updated, and unfold in marvelous ways, as we yes. will be looking forward for your new content 
contents Robert. So everyone go follow Robert, check on his website, trianglefeldenkreis.com. Thank you so much, Robert. It's been such a pleasure. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation. My pleasure. And for the essentialist that if you are not already subscribed to the essential emails, go to centraldepoder.com and yeah, jump in. So you get these episodes delivered weekly to your email. Until then, take care and remember to take the time to know your fire so you can share the flame.